I'm really pleased to uh, present to you tonight's speaker, which is Professor uh, Justin Bell Burnell. I'm Pierre Grace, I'm chair of the Institute of Physics in the Manchester branch, and this is the first face-to-face -face, uh, talk that we've had for quite a long time, and you're all very welcome. We also have a lot of people that are logged in online, and they're very welcome too. Jocelyn uh, started her life in Lurgan in the north of Ireland, and uh, famously had a little bit of an issue over doing science in her particular school, which didn't allow girls to do science and only boys. And once that little issue was resolved, uh, she came to school in York uh, and her experience of physics and mathematics was very different. Her physics teacher, she still speaks about fondly, Mr. Tillett. Uh, and from there, her interest in astronomy and physics was fostered and she did her undergraduate degree at the University of Glasgow. Uh, that led to a PhD at Cambridge, and famously there she undertook research in investigating the existence of quasars and discovered, she was the first person to discover pulsars, uh, for which I think some of you know uh, the leaders of her team won the Nobel Prize, and Jocelyn didn't. However, since then she's gone on to great fame, uh, so many things I've had to write them down. She's worked at a number of universities in the UK and in the United States. She's been visit, visiting professor in Princeton. She was project manager for the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii. Uh, she's been uh, appointed chancellor of uh, Dundee University 2018. And uh, in fact, in the same year, Jocelyn was awarded the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, uh, which some people say is like the 21st century Nobel Prize. That came with um, a fund of $3 million, which she donated to the IOP to support young women and people uh, in minority groups to, as young researchers. And uh, I think she's had numerous awards in her life. She was the first woman elected to the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She was the, only the second female recipient of the Copley Award. Um, she was awarded a CBE in 1999 and was awarded a DBE in 2007. Uh, she was once described as one of the 100 most powerful women in the UK. I'm not sure if that's true. And uh, the Institute of Physics were very pleased to rename their uh, annual prize for early career female physicists as the Jocelyn Bell Burnell Medal and Prize that's given out every year. Her generation, her ge generosity is boundless, and I can't tell you how pleased we are to have her today. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you to people here in the lecture theatre. Thank you also to people on Zoom. And because there is also a Zoom audience, I'm a bit constrained in how much I can move around. Um, normally I'd be walking all over the place. I will try and remember not to walk all over the place, but uh, if you find me over there, would you yell at me or over there? <laughs> so transient astronomy, or more colloquially, bursts, bangs and things that go bump in the night. The picture we have up here is a very famous astronomical photograph. It's called the Hubble Deep Field. Picture taken by the Hubble telescope um, as a result of staring for 143 hours at this one patch of sky. It's actually a very small patch of sky. It's the patch of sky that would be covered by a tennis ball 100 meters away from you. So it's really tiny. And because they've integrated, accumulated data for that long, they're seeing a number of faint things and therefore also seeing very distant things. And it's of huge interest to the public and particularly also to scientists. Almost everything you can see in that image is a galaxy. There's one star that you can see quite bright, um, a little down from the left, from the center of the image. And I know it's a star because you can see the, the spikes through it. Those are diffraction spikes. I think everything else is a galaxy. 
And one of the interesting things to astronomers is even seeing that far back in space, there is black between the galaxies. There is space between the galaxies. So people have had a lot of fun with this particular image and others like it, but there's one limitation, and that is that it's an average over 143 hours of observation. And if anything goes yoo-hoo, it'll get averaged out. There might be a faint, you know, something near my head in the image, but no, you miss anything that moves or anything that changes brightness. So I probably said all that's on this particular slide. I'm interested today in things that flare or die or otherwise change their brightness. And in doing that kind of study, you also pick up things that move, you know, comets, killer asteroids, things like that. Oh, and satellites. And satellites are increasingly a problem for astronomers. There's more and more of them. And there have been proposals to put up a hell of a lot, which are causing real concern for optical astronomers. Um, there's some negotiations going on, which I hope will come to a useful constructive solution. But satellites move and satellites get picked up on astronomical photographs. So by analogy, Imagine you had very, very slow eyes and brains. So slow that you didn't distinguish between the red light, the amber light, and the green light on traffic lights. You'd see some sort of average, all three lights half on. And clearly, as traffic lights, they wouldn't work. To see the changing pattern of traffic lights, you have to have slightly more responsive eyes. So it's, it's analogous with that. If you integrate for too long, you integrate out a lot of things that change. But we've been limited by the size of our telescopes, the sensitivity of our photographic plates and so on. And we've traditionally been integrating, taking long exposures and missed out on a lot of stuff as a consequence. Um, Radio astronomers learnt with the discovery of pulsars that there are things that change quite fast and they've been more alert to the changing radio sky. Um, X-rays and gamma ray astronomers have also been alert to the changing X-ray and gamma ray sky, but optical astronomers are late coming to that game. But optical transient monitoring, looking for optical transients, has now become quite big business. And a number of older telescopes have been repurposed. Okay. Now, this is here of three telescopes. The top right one, uh, quite an old type of telescope, Schmidt Telescope, uh, in Australia, now owned by Uppsala University, being used to look for things that flare or change their brightness and or things that move. Um, the center one is um, Mount Palomar. I'll talk. Uh -huh. Oh, you've, right, okay, this is interesting. Yep, it's okay. I'll talk about the Palomar one a bit more in a moment. The one on the left is a relatively new telescope for looking for things that move. Um, it's in Hawaii, called Pan Stars. And they got money for it by telling the American government that they were going to look for killer asteroids. Because things that move also show up when you take short exposures. Because you can see first it's there, and then it's there, and then it's there, and then it's there. And you can work out its trajectory. Palomar is a very famous observatory. And, okay, we'll come back to Palomar in a minute or two. Uh, this particular picture, you've got two images side by side. In the right hand, um, there's two bright objects, including one in the center of the field. In the left hand image, that center of the field object is not there. 
it is something that has flared up. The first, the left-hand image was taken around the turn of the year 2005-2006. The image on the right is taken in May 2006. So within five months, that very bright object has appeared. There's a real art in deciding how frequently you re-photograph the same part of sky, um, how long you leave between images and so on. Um, one pattern is to take four 30 second long integrations, exposures, um, each of those 10 minutes apart, and then go away, do that on another part of the sky do four more images of 30 seconds exposures, and then move on to another part of the sky, and come back to the first bit of the sky 28 days later, and repeat the pattern, four images, uh, 30 second exposures, 10 minutes apart. The 28 days, can anybody in the auditorium tell me what's special about 28 days? The moon. If you come back 28 days later, you've got the same phase of the moon and the same amount of stray light. So it makes it easier to compare the two images. The other thing you have to do is to look at your images very, very quickly. And if anything has changed, yell, tell other observatories. There's a transient flaring at such and such a position. We've seen it in the optical in this particular wave band. Um, Observations from you would be very helpful if you can manage it, kind of thing. So announcing the changes is quite important, and announcing them quickly is essential. Uh, an example of a survey that I think no longer takes place, um, Catalina, they had two telescopes, 1.5 meters and 0.7 meters in size. Um, one, yeah, they were both in Arizona, and between them, they covered about three quarters of the sky. And they ran this particular survey for about 10 years. And they found 12,000 optical transients, 12,000 things that either moved or changed their brightness or both. Now, most of these turned out to be active galactic nuclei, quasar-like things, which, you know, do vary, or supernovae, which are exploding stars, and clearly do change, and another category of variable star called a cataclysmic variable. But not everything fell into those categories. This is a map showing all the events that the Catalina telescopes picked up. It's plotted in galactic coordinates. So the Milky Way is along that band in the center of the oval. And they didn't attempt to observe in the Milky Way there's far too many objects packed close together. And even if one of them, you know, waved and said, yeah, you wouldn't know which one it was because there were so many close packed stars in their images. So they avoided the galactic plane. They then categorized the things that they had picked up varying. Um, red things are supernovae, that's exploding stars. Blues are cataclysmic variables. Green are extragalactic other galaxies way beyond our own, probably quasars, that have very active nuclei, and a category called magenta, which is other. And you can probably see that the sort of an S shape starts bottom left, swings up to the center, picks up the far side of the center, goes up to the top and swings right. That's the ecliptic plane, the plane that the sun and the planets move in in this particular way of plotting the sky. And these other things are probably small solar system bodies, asteroids, maybe some comets, things like that, which are moving. They may not be changing their brightness, but because they move, they register as variable objects. And there's a surprising number of them, isn't there? Back to Palomar. Been famous telescopes on Mount Palomar in California, and one of them in particular, a Schmidt telescope, has been repurposed for this particular kind of astronomy. They've been running it since about 2008, and as well as finding lots and 
lots more and lots of different kinds of stuff. Um, they've also found some unexpected things, which I will talk about. Um, they've found, for instance, very short, strong, explosive things. Things that are about 10,000 times as bright as a, an exploding star, a supernova. So there's some quite very dramatic, very short, flaring things up there in the sky. Uh, they've upgraded it more recently. It's now known as the Zwicky Transient Factory. And typically every day they find a new supernova, a new exploding star. So there is a lot going on that we never suspected because we never looked at the sky in this way. And some extremely surprising things. Uh, I'm going to explain to you, or endeavour to explain to you, um, a phenomenon, a relativistic phenomenon called lensing, and in particular, microlensing. So in this picture, we have on the right-hand side a star that you're busy studying. You are on the Earth, that blue-green thing on the left of the picture. And while you're busy studying your favourite star, another star wanders in between you and it. All the stars are in motion. The galaxy does differential motion. So you can get stars moving past stars. So a mid-distance star moves past your favourite star. And the gravity from that mid-distance star bends some of the light rays from the distant star into your telescope. Rays that would normally miss the Earth and never be picked up by your telescope. So for a little bit, while that mid-star is perfectly between you and your favourite star, you get more light from your favourite star. You see it flare, in other words. It's not actually the star flaring. We now realise it's that more light is going into your telescope. Um, this happens quite often because the galaxy is rotating. There's differential rotation and you can get quite a lot of chance alignments. And sometimes things that weren't visible become visible because there's a nearer star acting as a lens. So here's a sequence, a little story of some things they've started finding. The yellow star at the top of the left-hand panel is your favourite star that you want to observe. Down the bottom is a plot of how the light you get from your favourite star changes as another star moves between you and it and then some more rays of light into your telescope and so you appear to see it flare. Okay, second panel in, your intruding star, the red one, has a planet. Fairly normal, lots of stars have planets. And you see the increase in light as the star passes, the intruding star passes between you and your favourite star. And you see another smaller blip of light when the planet is aligned perfectly between your favourite star and you. So you can say, aha, that star has a planet. And sometimes the planet is on such a wide orbit, we're in the third panel now, that the blip from the planet comes appreciably after the blip from the star, but not so far away that you are really puzzled. You reckon it's probably a planet round your favourite star. But in the fourth panel, we can see our favourite star and we can see a planet with no parent star in sight. And you see this little blip from a planet. You've discovered orphan planet or maybe a free floating planet. There are a number of planets around that are no longer attached to a parent star. And this is one of the best ways of finding them, looking for these tiny blips. Uh, increasingly, we're finding more and more of these. They seem to be, well, relatively common. Um, and we didn't expect there to be probably several thousand of them rattling around, not that far from us. So those are some of the things, unusual things you can do in optical wave bands. But astronomers these days work not only in the optical 
which is the tiny colored rainbow part of this spectrum. We also work out the right beyond ultraviolet in X-rays and gamma rays. And we also work out the left through the infrared into millimeter and longer radio wave. So astronomy is done right across the spectrum. And indeed, even these days, there is another totally different spectrum called a gravitational wave spectrum. But I'm not going to say much about that today. But I do want to talk a bit about what the X-ray astronomers are finding, the gamma ray astronomers, and some of the things that the radio astronomers are finding. Because it's not just optical astronomy that has all fun in this particular game. Starting with gamma rays, there is an interesting backstory to this. Way back in the 1960s, the United States and the Soviets signed a nuclear test ban treaty. There would not be nuclear weapon tests in the Earth's atmosphere. The US was suspicious and thought that the Soviets might not keep to this. So they put up a number of satellites to check. The satellites would look for the gamma ray flash that came from a nuclear test. Uh, they arranged that there were always at least two and preferably three satellites up at any one time so that they could get a fix on where the gamma ray burst was coming from. And if it was in the atmosphere over the Soviet Union, they would be very suspicious. And these satellites started picking up gamma ray bursts. It turned out that they weren't from over the Soviet Union. It turned out they weren't coming up from the Earth at all. They were coming down from space. This was highly classified work, and it was five or six years before they were allowed to publish this result, but they had discovered a new phenomenon called gamma ray bursts. There are things out there that give short flashes of gamma rays. And this particular graph shows you one of them. Um, the numbers along the bottom of the graph are in seconds, and you can see that the thing lasts 10 or 20 seconds. It's very strong, well above the sort of ambient noise. Uh, that particular one was discovered in 1997, December the 14th. That's how it's, it's named, year, month, day. So once these things were made public, everybody got very interested and a lot more were found. And this particular plot uh, this oval, again, has the galaxy, the Milky Way, along the middle. The different colored dots represent the strength of the different gamma ray bursts. This is when they've got almost 3,000 of them. And they're looking to see if they're concentrated. In particular, if they're concentrated along the center band as coming from the Milky Way, of being associated with our galaxy. And there's no concentration along the center. These things are nothing to do with the Milky Way, it would seem. Either they are extremely, extremely close, so you see them all round and you don't sort of say see the Milky Way, or they're extremely distant, they're nothing to do with the Milky Way, they're a way out in the universe beyond our galaxy. And which of those was correct was an argument that raged for a long, long time. Meanwhile, people continued to pick up these gamma ray bursts at a rate of about one a day. And while it's on, it's by far the brightest gamma ray thing in the sky. They continued studying them and made a histogram of how long the burst lasted. And this particular graph has got two peaks showing, in fact, there are two populations of gamma ray bursts creatively called short and long. Less than two seconds is short, longer than two seconds is a long gamma ray burst. We now believe the short bursts are the merger, are produced in the merger of two neutron stars. The longer gamma ray bursts, I'll come back to in, in a little bit. So, these people watching for Soviet illicit Soviet nuclear tests have actually discovered two distinct phenomena. They are quite different. 
The only thing they have in common is they give gamma rays. But astrophysically, they are totally different. So it's two for the price of one, assuming there aren't even subsets of either of those. The short gamma ray bursts, less than two seconds. Um, diagram on the right, there's two orange blobs in the top bit. That's two neutron stars orbiting each other. They emit gravitational radiation. The two stars gradually get closer as they lose energy to gravitational radiation, and they end up colliding. And the collision probably gives a black hole. Um, it will incidentally give gravitational waves, which are one of the very new things in astrophysics. Um, and they've seen several of these kinds of mergers with the gravitational wave telescopes. Um, the result is probably a black hole. Two neutron stars merge to give a black hole. Um, and a narrow jet of gamma rays comes out of the merger. And if the narrow jet of gamma rays points at the Earth or your satellite, you see a short gamma ray burst. Long gamma ray bursts, probably due to exploding stars, supernovae, or extra big supernovae called hypernovae. We pick up a lot of words from the marketing profession, don't we? And it's thought that the collapse of a very massive star, a hypernova, might make a neutron star, might make a star made of quarks, or even more likely make a black hole. And in the process of shrinking down, produces a very narrow jet of gamma rays, which if they're pointing at your satellite, you pick up a gamma ray burst. So, Already with just the gamma rays, we're finding a lot of new kinds of things and new ways of studying them as well. Optical astronomers kept trying to find where these gamma ray bursts were coming from, in part to settle a debate where they Milky Way or beyond. And it's quite a hard task, but they did manage one particular capture around about 1999. Uh, it was a long burst, and we have here two photographs of the same patch of sky, taken with different telescopes and cameras, so there's a different amount of sort of background speckle. But you can see some of the features, uh, recognized features, uh, common to both of them. And at the tip of the arrow is something that brightened at the point that that gamma ray burst came. And it's not there in the previous photograph five years previously. And at the tip of the arrow in the right-hand photograph, it's part of a galaxy. It's something in an external galaxy. So the long bursts come from something in distant galaxies. Um, probably the merger of two neutron stars, as we now know. Uh, it must be extremely energetic if we're seeing things at such great distance. Although if you pack all the radiation into a very narrow beam, a bit like a searchlight, it can be quite strong. But then you have to have it shining exactly at you to see it. And they reckon these things happen at the rate of about a few per galaxy per million years. So they're going, you know, there's a lot of galaxies in the universe, so they're, they're going off quite regularly. Another type of phenomenon that we've come to recognize are called tidal disruption events. So this image is um, a sequence of images packed into one. You have a black hole, which is just bottom bit below right of the center of the photograph, represented by that black circle. And you've got a star that starts in the top left and is on a trajectory that takes it too close to the black hole too close for its own good. And as it gets closer to the black hole, the forces on different parts of the star are different. There's tidal effects, and the star gets pulled into the cigar shape. And as it goes closer to the black hole, the cigar breaks up into discrete bits, and the bits fall into the black hole, blip, 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 blip. And each bit falling in, produces something like an X-ray or a gamma ray flare or maybe a radio flare. Uh, one very recent result, which is extremely hard to explain, 
you may be aware that in Antarctica, there is a detector called Ice Cube, which is about a cubic kilometer of detectors to pick up elusive particles called neutrinos. It's now fully functioning and beginning to pick up things. And it has picked up neutrinos in, I think, on three occasions when we have been observing a tidal disruption event. So somehow this kind of event also produces neutrinos. How the heck it does that, I haven't a clue at the moment, but the data is accumulating. The tidal disruption events produce neutrinos, which Ice Cube in Antarctica can pick up. So watch this space. There's developments happening right, left and center. The very long gamma ray bursts have been observed by satellites. Um, one particular satellite called SWIFT actually observed a gamma ray burst that lasted two days, not two seconds, two days, not 10 seconds, two days. This is something different. Um, it's now suspected that it's also one of these tidal disruption events where stuff is falling into a black hole. Um, and they've maybe found a second one as well. At the moment, we have very little clue how that happens either. But it's beginning to look as if tidal disruption events, when a star or a lump of gas falls into a black hole, that there can be all sorts of other consequences. And we're only just surfacing this, so we don't have explanations at the moment. But watch this space. Crab Nebula. Messier 1, amateur astronomers probably will recognize it very well. It's the remains of a star that exploded in 1054 AD and was observed by the ancient Chinese and written up by the ancient Chinese. And there's a pulsar in the middle that is the remains of that exploded star. Um, the nebula is still shining, surprisingly, all these years after 1054 because the pulsar keeps it powered. And it looks as if there's other mischief going on as well. Um, this is a source of gamma rays. Okay, that's not too surprising. But some gamma ray uh, telescopes, two of them, Fermi and Agile, found big flares, 30 in 30 fold increase in the gamma ray flux from the crab, lasted for a few days before it died down again. At the moment, we haven't a clue what that is. It's probably something to do with the pulsar in the center, but this is not behavior we've seen anywhere else before. So we're guessing, to be honest, and we're watching because if we can find more of these, we begin to get a grip on what they are. Um, radio wavelengths, still a radio astronomy is still something that interests me. And one of the more exciting and amazing stuff has come in radio astronomy. Just a tiny bit of physics. Uh, apologies to any physics students, physics teachers in the audience. Uh, you know that you can get light split up into its constituent colors. You see it in a rainbow, the raindrops do it. You can see it here on Earth, I mean, in a lab if you have a prism or something like that. The different wavelengths, different frequencies get spread out. There's a similar effect happens with radio waves. It's not glass prisms that do it for radio waves. It's free electrons. And this was discovered rather by accident. Um, for a while, there were people listening to the radio waves, the, the phenomena, clicks and hisses and so on, that get produced in the near Earth environment, the ionosphere and the Earth. And they heard something that they called a whistler, which goes something like a descending note. If there's a lightning stroke in New Zealand, which is roughly our antipodes, it produces a radio wave as well as a flash of light and a few other things. And the radio wave travels around to here, following the loop of the Earth's magnetic field. And as it travels round, it passes free electrons. And free electrons 
slow radio waves, but they slow the low frequencies more than the high frequencies. So the high frequencies arrive first. And if you're listening to the various clicks and whistles that the Earth makes, you might hear that descending note. And you say to yourself, ha, lightning in New Zealand. Um, I think I won't try and taunt the system we have here today to try and play the audio file. The graph is useful, however. The diagram has frequency plotted up the way and time along the way. And you can see a wonderful curved signal starting center top, descending, ending bottom right. If you heard that, that would be. If the lightning, if the source of the whistler were nearby, it would go. Don't whistle it. Very short. If it's very far away, it goes. So how quickly the note descends tells you how many electrons the radio wave has come past. Uh, contrast it. On the left-hand side of the image, there's a vertical bar. That's come past virtually no electrons. That's somebody in the lab next door. And equally, on the right-hand side, there's a kind of double bar. That's come no distance. That's in the lab next door. So pulsar astronomers regularly check their pulses to make sure they have not come from the lab next door. And they look for this descending whistle. Um, let me just click on one more. Yeah, no, I'll go back and do it in the order I've got. Okay, so the image is a um, cartoon impression of what a pulsar is. Very small star, 10 miles across, spinning rapidly on its axis. Got a very strong magnetic field that's inclined. And somehow... Some people think they understand, some of us certainly don't. Somehow, from out of that conical region near the magnetic pole, where the field lines are open, there comes a beam of radio waves. And as the star spins, the beam of radio waves sweeps around the sky. And if it sweeps over your radio telescope, you see flash, 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 flash. And you say, ha-ha, pulsar. Except it might just be the guy in the lab next door. So you've got to check for that, but that's broadly speaking. So pulsar astronomers are always checking their dispersion. They're looking for that curved signal. Now, what happened was pulsar astronomers were busy doing their regular job, looking for the nice curved signal, and they picked up one very nice short, sharp pulse seen in the black inset in the diagram. Um, an extremely strong pulse, very neat, very tidy, without a doubt, real. And they also did this plot of frequency against time. And I hope you can see the trace that starts top left and curves down to bottom left. That's showing that that radio wave has come past a whole load of electrons and is not from the lab next door. The one snag is when you work out how many electrons it has come past, it's a hell of a lot. That signal, that curved signal is much more stretched out than you would expect from a pulsar. There are many, many, many more electrons it's come past. Indeed, there aren't enough electrons in the galaxy to give that degree of spread out. Screen's failed again. Let's try. You've got yours. Good. I hope the online people have still got theirs. So this descending line has come past far too many electrons. Thank you. There aren't that many electrons in the galaxy. Where the hell is this thing coming from? And the answer is it's coming from another galaxy. Well, for a long time, people didn't believe this one result. And then they started finding more. And we've opened up a new field called fast radio bursts. Wonder why. FRBs for short. And we now have probably about a thousand of these, all from extragalactic. 
and let me move on. Okay, here's some images of them, right. Several thousand now, they usually stand up loud and clear. We check their dispersion and yep, there's a lot of electrons. Um, interesting diversion when at Parkes radio telescope, they started picking up um, some other bursts that look broadly similar, but not quite the same. And weren't really too sure what these other bursts were. Interference cast real doubt over the whole field for a while. And then a graduate student made a plot of when these other Parkes radio telescope funny bursts occurred. And they made a plot against local time. And there was a peak between 12 noon and 1 p.m. What do we do around that time of day? We have lunch. Parkes radio telescope is away in the outback. Um, there's a residence for observers and staff mm, half a mile away uh, with a little kitchen with a microwave oven. So they suspected this microwave oven. They had actually tested it. They were pretty certain it was leak tight but they had one other idea. So for the first time in living history, they allowed mobile phones at Parkes radio telescope. There was one guy in the control room standing by the recorder with a mobile phone. And there was one guy in the kitchen with a mobile phone and a broom, a long handled broom. And he'd say, ready, steady, go. And he stopped the microwave by opening the door. If you stop your microwave by opening the door, you get a burst of microwaves in your chest. You might just like to know this. And the microwave oven scans in frequency because steam and water and ice molecules all vibrate at slightly different frequencies. So the microwave oven goes yip, 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 yip. And if you stop a microwave oven by opening the door, that jup jup doesn't stop instantly. I was being picked up by the radio telescope. So please stop your microwave using the stop button so you don't get a chest full of microwaves. And if there's any radio telescopes near you, they'll be very pleased as well. Um, so, okay. After that diversion and scare, we went back to studying the real fast radio bursts. Um, still don't really know what they are. We have discovered that a fraction of them repeat, so it's not a catastrophic something. But we're also finding that the repeaters tend to have longer duration bursts over a narrower band of frequencies. So we've maybe hit on two different phenomena at once. This is all very new, the jury's still out, but you know, watch the scientific press. So maybe we've discovered two things for the price of one, and it wouldn't be the first time either. Um, one of the other things we've been able to do, because these fast radio bursts come from distant galaxies, we have on a few occasions managed to pinpoint with optical telescopes just where it's coming from. And they're coming from galaxies out there, somewhere, nowhere special in a galaxy out there. And that's interesting of itself, but it's also because we can get the redshift of that galaxy and we can get the number of electrons between the galaxy and us from the swoop down. We're beginning to um, understand how many, not understand how many, understanding where the material in the universe is, particularly the particles called baryons. Um, and it turns out that some mad theoreticians are right. Um, a fair fraction of the ordinary matter in the universe is in what they call the warm, hot intergalactic medium in the space between the galaxies. Again, this is very new stuff, um, but it's showing the powers of some of these new phenomena. Um, I should have put that slide before the previous one. I think I've said it. Some bursts come from massive galaxies. Optical observations give the redshift of the galaxy. The radio observations give the number of electrons. And we solve the missing baryon problem. There are a number of new telescopes coming online.
the most dramatic of which is, I think, the first, tele first major telescope to be named after a woman, the Vera Rubin telescope. It's in Chile. It's got a mirror that's 8.4 meters diameter. And the little picture, I hope, gives you some idea of the scale. There are uh, balconies, galleries. If you look on the left-hand gallery, you can see a white figure. That's the height of a person to scale. This particular telescope is going to look for things that flare and die, preferably on short time scales. It's going to produce somewhere between 1 billion and 10 billion of these events per night. No way can graduate students deal with that quantity of data. It's going to have to be automated. And if it's automated, you can then get the computer to send an automated email to any other observatory in the world who wants to get them saying, alert, event at right ascension, blah, 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 now. And if they wish, those other observatories can turn to those coordinates and see what they can see. So it's going to start observing maybe late this year, maybe next year. Uh, but it's going to be a whole new chapter in this game when it starts. In radio astronomy, there's the square kilometre array that's being built. Um, it's made up of lots and lots of dishes, some in Australia, some in South Africa. Uh, and transient detection, detecting of things that flare up and die in the radio, is one of its key projects. Um, part in, West, in Western Australia, this is part of their low frequency, longer wavelength, also looking for radio transients. And there's a low frequency away, array in Europe with little dots showing you where there are telescopes. Um, I have to add that there's now one in Ireland at Burr Castle off the left hand edge of the image. There's one in the UK as well. So LOFAR doesn't look very recognizable as a radio telescope. The high frequency stuff is under all that black polythene and the low frequency stuff looks like um, an array for growing grapes up or something like that. But actually both are radio telescopes. Um, I'll skip that slide. But LUFAR also has transients as a key project. So again, there could be a lot more interesting information. Although we don't quite know what we're going to, how strong they're going to be at these low radio frequencies. We won't really know for a bit yet. So this field of transient astronomy is arriving fast and delivering its punches fast. And I would expect there'll be more to come. So watch the press. I think we're embarking on some very interesting times. Thank you for your interest and your attention. And I hope I've left some time for questions. Thank you so much for uh, an amazing talk. Uh, those of us who do a little bit of astronomy, uh, 30 second exposures of deep sky is just an impossible technological challenge. That is amazing. We perhaps have time for a few questions. So uh, Melissa, would you like to, anybody like to ask a question? Can you speak very close to the microphone, please? I just wanted to ask Jocelyn, um, you mentioned about the orphan um, planet. Will that be Earth's fate? The, will, er, will, will the orphan planet be Earth's fate? Um, I don't know too much about the sizes and so on of the orphan planets, um, except I, I do know that they're finding quite a lot of them, but I don't honestly have details of them at the moment. Hi. Um, because of the highly directional nature of the, the beams, does that mean that the frequency of occurrence of pulsars and other items with the beams is just hundreds of times higher yeah. than the observations? Yeah. The narrower the beam, the fewer we see. So yes, uh, we're clearly missing a lot. But because we've got some idea of what sky coverage we have, we can estimate how many more there are. But we only see a tiny fraction. Oh, 
I think you mentioned that um, the Whistler effect was responsible for predicting that significant amount of baryons were in this place out, outside of galaxies. Is that right? Uh, not necessarily due to the whistle. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. All right, so it wasn't due to the Whistler effect. Okay, I was just going to ask because I think you mentioned that it was free electrons were responsible for the Whistler effect. Yes. Okay, yeah. misunderstanding. <laughs> Um, can you tell me if uh, James Webb is going to look for any transient event effects, please? I don't know, to be sure, whether the James Webb is going to do transient stuff. I don't know enough about it, to be honest. But given how long it takes to build, commission and build a telescope, most of this stuff has happened since the construction of the James Webb was started. So then it's a question of whether they could modify anything that they had planned and whether NASA would let them modify anything they had planned in order to do this. So I'm afraid I don't know to be sure, but I haven't heard anybody saying that James Webb will crack that one. It'll crack other things, but... I think we're going to go to online questions next. The microphone's just going up top where the online questions have come in. <laughs> Hello, so a question from Aaron online, the, what is your wish list for observations? Whoa, um, as you maybe can tell, I'm very excited by this transient field. Um, and I hope we'll be able to understand more of them and maybe even confirm one or two of the ideas that are still a bit tentative. But I think maybe my top priority would be those tidal disruption events, which appear to produce, you know, neutrinos and all sorts of peculiar stuff. How the heck is that happening? So that's, that's one of the more most surprising of, of a really quite surprising set of things going on. Well, I think that links to another question that, how do you decide what to search for? Is it driven by theory? That's from Amanda. Right, um, sometimes uh, things are programmed a long way in advance and your discovery of a transient is quite by chance. Uh, the snag is you, can't say there's going to be a transient next Tuesday night at 10 51 p.m. Please point your telescope. You just don't know when it's coming. Uh, so quite a lot of stuff has to be done with equipment that is more survey type, but very well equipped with diagnostic spectrometers and things like that. Um, I think the Vera Rubin will probably pick up a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, it's just how the hell you cope with that data flow um <laughs> we'll see time will tell it'll be happening quite soon and there'll be people tearing their hair out <laughs> well we've got a lovely question from lily what do you think is the most interesting fact about the universe uh i i'm currently very hooked on all this time domain stuff and, and i think i'm still amazed that the universe that we thought evolved slowly over billions of years is actually also doing very, very rapid things. So I find that staggering and exciting. And obviously some very curious physics going on in the midst of all that. So I find that really interesting. I think there was another question here. Thank you. As an astronomer, you are working over such immense spaces of time and space. I wonder, if astronomers such as yourself are drawn to looking at our own perfectly exceptional little planet and perhaps more worried than most people about climate change that is taking place at the moment. I'm a little bit surprised we don't have yet astronomers acting for climate change. Mm -hmm. Any observations, please? Yeah. Astronomers um, in the past have probably been responsible for quite a lot of the air miles 
as we fly to you know, the west coast of the USA to make observations, or to Hawaii, or to Australia. And one of the things we've learned through the pandemic is how much you can do remotely. So I think that's going to be quite a change in the way astronomers operate, and I think it will be largely for the better. Um, I hope nonetheless that young astronomers starting out do still get the chance to go to a telescope and don't see it all on a small square screen um, because you can't capture the ambiance of being, you know, up a mountain at 2 a.m. just looking at the small square screen. Okay, I think we'll perhaps uh, finish there. Um, Justin, thank you so much for that. That was amazing. I think uh, your illustrious career and your support for young people in particular has been just uh, legendary. Um, those of you listening to your talk tonight, especially uh, young people who have, perhaps haven't embarked on a career in physics yet or perhaps thinking about doing a PhD, you've given us lots of instances of things we just don't know and there's lots to explore. So if you want some PhD ideas, there's plenty there up on the screen. Um, I'm going to finish there. I've just I'm just going to uh, just one quote. I was looking at the quotes from uh, Justin. She's got many, many quotes, but I just one, and we'll finish with that, and then we'll thank her one last time. Um, at one time, she said, "Once a star dies, it's gone forever. There are no new stars to take its place. Eventually, there will be no stars, and the universe will turn black. That really will be the end. But until then, hopefully." Some of you will perhaps come to the next talk, which you'll find on the IOP, IOP uh, website. So thank you very much, all of you who are here and at home. And I'd ask you one last time to thank Justin.